I'd like to call on Helmut Goldie to comment on the language of Bill of Rights versus resident protection. Would you say that? Uh, thank you. Uh, we struggled with a number of names because some people got uptight with the name Bill of Rights and sounded too belligerent. At Mirabella, when we worked the problem, we actually broadened it. We developed the Bill of Rights and responsibilities. Thanks to Catherine Pearson. And uh, that was, uh, it also showed what responsibilities we, we as residents have vis-a-vis -vis management. But then when we have a committee, a uh, statewide committee, which or a regional-wide committee that works the whole issue, and they came up with the term resident protection as a better term to not scare away our leading age friends. So you might want to consider this as a, another term that might be more palatable for some people. I don't know. It's That's good, That's a, a good uh, observation. The thing I'd like to observe, too, is that why haven't we listed the uh, model laws? Model laws were, were listed. That was the financial. The financial strength out of the whole area. So that was uh, that was. I, the, I think that should have a, be a high priority for that this. That is a high priority. And that's what Walt had done. Yeah, the, the, they, the they, model laws presentation. Yeah, that did that did emerge as a, a high priority, higher than the fair accounting. Yeah, and that, that is, you know, that is with the NEIC right now. We yes. haven't done anything with it, but we hope we can do something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I would, I would like to comment on the, on the name of Bill of Rights. That, um, the, Bill, the term Bill of Rights is famous in the United States because of our Constitution and the first ten amendments to the Constitution. Uh, several states have uh, started ombudsmen in their states for assisted living and skilled nursing uh, facilities. And those uh, in many states, uh, those arms movements have put out built a, a statement which is called a Bill of Rights for those residents in nursing homes and in, in skilled units and assisted living units. Uh, so I don't think there's anything really terrible about the term Bill of Rights, but if you want to change it, I guess I can't you know, check it too much. I just think it has a it's our own history, which means something to a lot of people. Yeah. The thing about it is that uh, in, the, uh, in the state legislation, it's called residence rights rather than a bill of rights. Yeah. If you're in a nursing home, they don't give you a bill of rights. They tell you the rights of residents who live in nursing homes. And that's listed there, and it's enforced by the state. But a bill of rights is a, a term that they don't usually mm -hmm. use. Jack. Yes, yes, Jack. Um, Catherine could probably do this better than I was going to ask Catherine, too. What? I was going to ask also okay. Catherine. To uh, a couple of things. Walt mentioned the fact that there are ombudsmen in several states. There are ombudsmen in every state that are required under the older American um, Jack. Jack, would you have them mute their phones? That's, that's my suggestion also. Ask the people on the other end to mute their phones. Well, no, I, I think their phones are muted. Yeah, I think the better came up with a better solution, which is turn the volume down on the phone. Because uh, they're not talking right now. That's a very good idea. But uh, we, we could probably mute our phones on that. But anyway, uh, uh, that, that's required under the Older Americans Act of 1965. So uh, that is in every state. Uh, OBRA 87, the Omnibus Budget Re uh, Reconciliation Act of 1987, incorporated a resident bill of rights for nursing homes. And that's federally mandated. Uh, and uh, it has all the positive and negatives of federal legislation. The positive is it's instant. It goes in everywhere. It applies right away. And you've got unlimited funds for its enforcement because the federal government has no bounds. And it can't be questioned because the federal government has sovereign immunity. 
It has a negative side that uh, sometimes people don't know what it means and how to interpret it, and it's, uh, but, but that's an approach. Another approach is the approach that's been followed now in Connecticut, and uh, we have it in California and other states where it's enacted into state law. In California, we have a very extensive bill of rights. It's quite lengthy. I think there are 21 provisions in it. Uh, there are so many, you hardly know where to start reading. And, uh, but uh, they told me as good as the enforcement. Another approach is what I found some doing, I believe, in the state of Washington, if I'm not mistaken, where they go to providers and try to get providers to voluntarily agree that these are rights that they're going to they're going to maintain as a good practice. Frankly, I think that's a very excellent way to go. But uh, How is there that? are different. So the term bill of rights has many, many meanings and. Uh, I, if the, I haven't gotten this pushback from providers, but if we did, we could certainly do what they do. They're uncomfortable with the name CCRC, so they want to change the name. And why not change the name? You know, if you, get, if you get extra points by changing the name, change the name. But uh, usually, it doesn't change the substance. So that, that's what like. And uh, any more that you want to add on to that, or you're, uh, Catherine? What do you? What are your Think well, certainly I'm probably one of the reasons why Bill of Rights language, that phrase, um, came about because in 2009-10 when the um, um, Senate Committee on Aging was looking at continuing care communities in large part as a result of the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 and its impact on continuing care, particularly Erickson being this model of bankruptcy at the time. They, they had an investigation, they had a, um, um, a um, you know, what, what's the agency, I'm just having brain uh, brain. Government Accountability. GAO, yeah, GAO, Government Accountability Office. Uh, they came in and did a study, and as they were doing the study, they kept coming back and asking me questions about who to go to for certain things. And I finally said, well, part of the problem is that there isn't a general federal template and so we went back and forth on how can you create a general federal template. And it's hard to do because you have to have a, finance, a federal nexus for creating any type of federal legislation. The reason why I use the Bill of Rights um, rather than some other statutory suggestion was because it already existed in, as Jack pointed out, uh, federal legislation affecting nursing homes. And it was very effective when it was first um, adopted in the 80s. Um, one of the most important was freedom of restraints. That was not a uniform position. Mm -hmm. And defining what restraints were as being both chemical and physical restraints, or even um, you know something short of uh, chemical or physical. And so that was a big game changer in the nursing home industry. Um, so that's why I knew that at least there was a template that you could use for that language. Did I also know that it would be challenging as a federal uh, standard? The answer is yes, because the way in which you have a federal nexus to do it for nursing homes is that nursing homes can be eligible directly for Medicare or Medicaid. And so the nexus was if you want Medicaid, if you want federal dollars, or if you provide care that could pr trigger federal dollars, you had to have a bill of rights for your residents, as, and you had to have follow that national bill. We don't have quite that easy of a federal nexus challenge, or federal nexus identity. So, but when we did it, we certainly knew that it was going to be a challenging proposition for um, providers, which it proved to be. Um, I'm, I'm always an advocate of asking for what you want and being willing to compromise. And um, so that was part of the thinking of, um, in some states, such as Washington, uh, where we knew that uh, the Bill of Rights could be called the Bill of Rights and Responsibilities or other language. And I think it's I think it's completely acceptable to match what you actually label something to make it adoptable and enforceable and, uh, and, and supportive. Any other comment from the board? Anybody from the gallery want to comment? Oh, yes, sir. 
Perhaps we could call it a bill of responsibilities, provider and consumer. Bill of responsibilities. So just change the language so that instead of the resident having the right, the provider has the responsibility. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other comments? Yes. I agree with Catherine. If you keep a known um, wording, that you're going to make more progress than if you come up with something totally different, even though we know what it means. Yeah. Dave, are you going to say something? Just, just a caveat of uh, Connecticut experience. We found immediately that there were residents who decided that a Bill of Rights, on, on your page here, Bill of Rights gave them the opportunity to go to the providers and say that they had certain rights. They, they just immediately took it in their hands to, to abuse it. And so there is that to be, I think, I, I like the idea of responsibility. <laughs> Any others? Yes. Maybe there's a compromise of calling Bill of Rights parenthesis. <laughs> yeah. Something else so that you have two audiences. One is ultimately going to be the government, and the other is going to be the residents. Yeah. If, if they don't talk, as we're hearing it's hard to do, then just explain to the residents what it is. Always have that consistent along with the Bill of Rights. And I have to say that one of the things I heard um, from you, the notion of perhaps, I think when we, uh, when I first proposed it, it was Bill of Resident Rights, but I like the idea of Bill of, of whatever rights and responsibilities. I like the idea of consumers being the label that you use in advocating for this. And one of that is a very practical um, concern. Um, the, um, you know, the Bureau of Consumer Protection, whatever the name of it is at the federal level, has become a very strong advocate for seniors. Mm -hmm. And um, and they're willing to take things on. And I think something that used that label would give you a little organizational um, strength um, at that level. Elizabeth Warren, you know, her connection to that organization has made it a pretty advocacy-minded organization. Any other? Yes, yes. Maybe, maybe I can make a few comments. Because New Jersey does have a strong Bill of Rights organization, Bill of Rights law. And the law was enacted at, uh, at the, because of the help from Orange, the organization that I'm with. And that organization worked with the uh, legislature, and they passed a law that was passed in uh, 2013, signed by Governor uh, Christie. I brought along some uh, pamphlets uh, at the request of Bob Nicholson. And uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm uh, going to put a stack of them here. Anybody who wants to can, uh, can take one of them. This was issued by the Ombudsman. We have a good Ombudsman, uh, Jim McCracken, who looks after the interests of both uh, of all three levels, uh, in the Medicare, nursing care, and assisted living. So uh, I'll just leave these here in case anybody wants them. Thank you. That is a great, a great brochure. The thing about it is that this uh, says you have rights. It doesn't say there's a bill of rights. You know, in the, in the enabling legislation in Virginia, the enabling legislation lists four rights for residents. It doesn't say it's a bill of rights. It simply lists if you're going to open up a CCRC, the residents who live there have these four rights. And you... Uh, uh, if you uh, if you join a union, the people who who are in the union, I mean, workers have certain rights too, but they don't call it a bill of rights; they call it workers' rights. So there's such a thing as workers' rights that differ from residents' rights, and I think we need to make a distinction there. This is residents' rights that we're concerned about, and and when they post, my husband's in healthcare, and on every floor. There's posted the rights of residents in health care. It doesn't say a bill of rights. It just says if you're in health care, you have these rights. Now that's the over 87 legislation that we were talking about. They're required to post that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, but one of the over, over, over things that is evident here is 
This widespread interest in resident rights means that residents today do not feel they have rights. What kind of an industry is going to attract future residents if the existing residents are so unhappy that they have to go and legislate to try to get the basic rights that other people just enjoy by being members of the community and not moving in? The industry has to step up and listen to this if it's to survive. So let's call it residence rights. If you're a doctor's patient, you have patient's rights. Patients have a right, you know, in a relationship with their doctor. Well, sorry, sorry. So, you, you know, you watch a lot the of doctor gives you orders, rights. right? The <laughs> rights for, the, for that particular, and they're different. Okay, Great. I move that we put all the discussion as uh, to commend it to our further consideration of the Bill of Rights and move on. Yeah. Is there a second to that? Second. All right, all in favor? All right. All right, and, and opposed? So we know that our work is cut out for us, and so thank oh, you. Oh, yeah, sir, so we're, we're on seven. seven. Okay. Well, we just finished seven. We just finished seven. Good. Good. All right, I thank you for that. And it's very great uh, to hear the <coughs> different opinions yeah. and the bottom lines and, her, and the discussion. And thank you so much. And thank you, Catherine, for your, your statements. Okay.